Hi, welcome to Worship at Medicine Street United Methodist Church. I am Harriet Bryan, and we are thrilled that you have joined us for worship today. If you live in our area, we invite you to be a part of our pictorial directory. Photos will be taken on April 15th, 16th, and 17th. You can learn more about it and sign up on our website. I'm also excited to let you know that we have a plan for Holy Week and Easter now. We are going to have four in-person worship services on Easter and hope to live stream two of those. Pastor Jared will be telling you more about these services at the end of the service today, but I wanted to pique your interest now and to tell you to be on the lookout for information about these services. And now, friends, I always want you to fill out a digital attendance card, so if you've not already done so, please take just a few seconds so we may remain connected with you. And also, light a candle if you have one nearby, and take a deep breath as we continue worshiping God together. The Lord be with you. Too often, too easily, our eyes are drawn down to the suffering of victims and the pain of the perpetrators, to the wounds we inflict on ourselves. We need to see these things and pray, but we also need our eyes to be lifted to the signs of life among us, to the touch of healing on our souls, to the cross that cast its liberating shadow across all human affairs. We need our eyes to be lifted so our hearts may be filled with faith and hope and love. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you are from everlasting to everlasting. Let this time of worship be an encounter with you that will enable us to behold you in all people and in all situations. Amen.
Friends, in becoming one of us, God became poor so we could receive the riches of mercy. In coming to us, God took on our death so we could be made alive together with Christ. So let us come offering our confession, knowing that by grace we have been saved. Let us pray. The words we speak all too often do not show you in our lives, O God. We spend so much time boasting to others they imagine we have no need for you. We grumble impatiently when you don't respond immediately to our requests, but are slow to sing your praises. We mutter under our breath about the behavior of those around us when we could be asking them if there is some way we could serve them. It is on our journey to the cross and the tomb that you fill us with the riches of your mercy. You do so not because of anything we have done, but because of the compassion which flows from your heart, wounded by our failings. As we open our lives to receive your forgiveness, may we turn to the light which brings us life, following Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, every step of the way. Amen. Friends, how much does God love us? enough to send the divine heart, hope, and spirit to us, not to condemn us, but to save us, not by our speaking or doing, but by God's good and precious grace are we saved. Thanks be to God. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Hebrew Bible lesson is from the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter, beginning with verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, our gospel lesson this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, beginning at the third chapter and the 14th verse. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is right and true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How easy do you think it would be to go 21 days without complaining, without saying something negative about absolutely anything? Well, friends, the answer is it takes most of us, if we decide that we want to make this a goal, it takes most of us four to eight months. Now, how do I know this? Well, in 2006, Pastor Will Bowen issued a challenge to his church for the members to go 21 days without complaining and to help them track their progress in achieving this goal, he passed out purple bracelets. And you placed the bracelet on one arm and every time you complained, you placed it on the other arm. And when you finally were able to wear the bracelet on the same arm for 21 days, you knew that you had achieved your goal. 
By 2008, this became a national phenomenon, and Pastor Bowen was interviewed on national news syndicates. He was interviewed by Oprah, and people everywhere were putting on purple bracelets, trying to curb their complaining so that we could have what Bowen called a complaint-free world. I issued this challenge to the church that I was serving at that point in time, and I will tell you that it was a challenge. Now, why is this so challenging? Well, it's because we have a negativity bias. That's what psychologists tell us. We actually have a bias towards focusing on the negative and dwelling on the negative, being aware of what could go wrong and then dwelling on what has gone wrong. Evolutionarily speaking, this was probably a good thing early on because if you were aware of danger, if you were aware of what was going on, then you might have, you might increase your chances of surviving. But over the course of time, complaining has lost some of its usefulness. Now there are still occasions where complaining is useful, but I think it is important for us to be able to distinguish between complaining that is helpful and complaining that is harmful. When in the world is complaining helpful? Well, it's helpful when we've had an experience and we just need to get it off of our chest. We need to acknowledge what we are feeling. We need to vent so that we can move on and not bottle up the feelings so that they emerge later. Complaining can be helpful when we share what we're concerned about with someone that we love, perhaps someone who prays for us, so they know how to pray for us. This is what I tell my spouse anyway. Honey, I'm just telling you how I want you to pray for me. But it really can be a way to deepen relationships and to know what someone else is struggling with. And the third way, perhaps the most obvious way, that complaining can be helpful is when it is a prelude to action, to problem solving. We complain about something and then we figure out how we are either going to learn to live with it or how we are going to move forward. All complaining is not helpful though. Chronic complaining falls in this category. Science also tells us that synapses in our brain that fire together, wire together, and when we complain time and time again, we actually rewire the circuitry in our brains and we become negative people. And who wants to be around someone who's negative? So when we complain chronically, we not only harm our relationship with others, but we also harm our relationship with God. And that's certainly the case in this morning's lesson from Numbers. Let's take a closer look at this because this is a strange lesson. Now, what we need to know is that the complaint that we hear today is the last in a long line of complaints. As soon as God leads the people out of Egypt, almost the first thing they begin to do is complain. They complain that the water isn't sweet enough, it's bitter. And so God instructs Moses to sweeten it. They complain that they don't have food to eat. They had leeks and onions and wonderful things back in Egypt, and they don't have that anymore while they're wandering in the wilderness. So God sends manna to provide for them. And then they complain because they don't have meat, and God drives a flock of quail into their camp so that they can have meat. And today, in today's passage, they complain yet again, saying, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. This complaint is enough. This time, God's response to their complaining is not to provide for their need with manna or quail or sweet water, but instead it is to send fiery serpents into their midst that bite them and poison them, causing some of them to die. Well, the people immediately repent and beg Moses to pray on their behalf. And when Moses does so, God says, make a poisonous serpent, set it on a, bowl, a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. And so Moses makes a serpent of bronze, puts it on the pole, and those who have been bitten look up to the serpent and live. I told you it was a strange story. It leaves us scratching our heads a bit, doesn't it? 
there are different interpretations, but I think it's clear that enough is enough is enough. There is a point where we are called to cease complaining. And complaining, as I said earlier, can hurt our relationship with God. Com chronic complaining is a spiritual issue because it cuts us off from remembering and celebrating God's past faithfulness so that we can see what God is doing in the present and so that we can trust God with our future. When we perceive God as an absentee parent or as a vending machine, either one, give us what we want, we are reducing God and the relationship that God wants to have with us into either a non-existent relationship or a simple transactional relationship. And God wants so much more. God wants to walk with us, provide for us, to guide us, to love us, to know us, and to be known by us. And friends, that's the heart of this good news that we have in this strange story, that when the Israelites look at the serpent, they are reminded of God's love for them. It's a tough love. It's a love that makes them acknowledge their own part in their suffering, that these serpents, I believe this poison is simply a physical manifestation of an inward brokenness, of the poison of ingratitude that resides in their hearts. And when they look up, they are healed because they face who they are and they claim their dependence upon God. In many ways, this story foreshadows the first seven steps of the 12 steps in AA, if you're familiar with these, and they are we admitted that we were powerless, that our lives had become unmanageable. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. We made a decision to turn our lives and our will over to the care of God. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We admitted to God ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We were entirely ready to have God remove all defects of our character, and we humbly asked God to remove our shortcomings. If we fast forward several centuries to the conversation that John's, John's Gospel records that Jesus had with Nicodemus, we have a conversation about birth, light, spirit, and belief. I dare say most, if not all of us, can recite John 3.16, for God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. Well, friends, that's only part of what we have recorded in John's Gospel because we also have this interesting allusion to this story from Numbers, this story that Nicodemus, as a practicing Jew, would have known well. And Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. What an odd comparison. The loving, saving Messiah to the bronze replica of a poisonous snake? Well, what does it mean? And is it really that odd of a comparison? Because I believe that in both cases, we acknowledge our need for God to save us and to heal us. And we look to God for our salvation and for our healing. Like the Israelites who looked up at the serpent and acknowledged their brokenness and their need for healing, when we look up to the cross, we acknowledge our brokenness and our need for healing. At the cross, we are forced to acknowledge our shortcomings, our capacity for sinning, how easy it is for us to miss the mark, to turn away from good and to do evil, to refuse to love, to remain indifferent to the suffering of others or the consequences of our actions to minimize our connections with all that live and how what we decide to do impacts the lives of others, the lives of people who live around the globe even. And 
and when we look at the cross, we are reminded of how tempted we are to rely upon violence to save us and to protect us instead of putting our trust in the God of love. When the Son of Man is lifted up, we see a need, our need, for a God who will take our most horrific instruments of death and transform them at great cost for the purposes of resurrection. When we look up to the cross, we are saved from pride, power, domination, brokenness. The cross takes the worst in the world and the worst that is in us and responds with love and with forgiveness. When we look up to the cross, we find forgiveness, healing, and new life. But first, we must acknowledge our need for forgiveness, for healing, and for new life. Now, for some of this, this is really easy because we have a tendency to beat up on ourselves and to think we are not worthy of forgiveness. But the cross says otherwise. Some of us wear masks and pretend that we have it more together than we do, and we are slow to admit our need for the cross. And some of us just think, well, I'm not that bad, I'm good enough. Professor Stanley Harawas said in one of his sermons, now, we all have some sense that we often do something we later regret, so we know we're not perfect. We think, oh, I should not have been as candid with Mrs. Smith as I was, but she can really get on my nerves. I know I'm a bit selfish, but when everything comes out in the wash, I do my bit for others. I know I sh should not lie, but if I told the truth to X or Y, they would have been hurt. And when you add to this unending list of our petty failings, and we confess that we have sinned not only by what we have done and what we have left undone, then we understand that what we have left undone can cover a range of behaviors that are sufficient to make us sinners, but not worse than anybody else. I mean, while we know we may be sinners, we have trouble taking that description of ourselves all that seriously. We know that we are not perfect, but most of us think we are good enough. The truth is, most of us are good, conventional people who live good, conventional lives. But when we look up at the cross, we are reminded that within each of us, there is a bent to sinning, as Charles Wesley wrote in one of his hymns, that we are capable of violence and of harming others. When we look at the cross, we have to question. We might want to think we would be with those who stayed at the foot of the cross with Jesus, but we have to question and maybe acknowledge that we really would have been among those who would have shouted, crucify him! When we look to the cross, we acknowledge who we are, but we aren't blinded by who we are, and we don't fall into despair of who we are because in the cross, we also find healing and a love that looks squarely at us and stretches out arms to hug us and to embrace us. When we look up to the cross, we know that truly there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, and we give thanks. And so the invitation today, friends, is to over the course of this next week, consider how often you complain and whether it's harmful or helpful complaining. But a more important invitation is to give thanks, to give thanks on a regular basis, to, at the end of each day, think back over the day and thank God for all of the ways that God showed up. Maybe you even want to take time, my friend Joel Nolte suggested this exercise this week, to write out your timeline, beginning with birth and ending with today, and put markers of significant events that have happened to you across the way. And as you look at your timeline, look back and recognize where God has been at work so you can trust God in the present and claim God's future faithfulness. But give thanks. And the most important invitation this morning, my friends, is to look up at the cross 
to acknowledge our shortcomings and to know God knows them and God loves us. Let us confess trusting in God's mercy and in God's love. Amen. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we yearn for you. Deep inside, we desire to know that you love and accept us just as we are. We seek release from our past mistakes and regrets. Grant us the opportunity to move beyond the hurt, cowardice, and pain of our lives. We look for direction for your leadings and guidance for the important decisions we face or circumstances with which we must cope. As we draw closer to the cross in this Lenten season, we, like the disciples and others, seek to understand the mystery of Christ who draws all people to himself. We need the reassurance that you are present with us in our most difficult times, knowing that you do not abandon us in our time of need. Help us to live trusting that you can redeem all seemingly hopeless situations that surround us. We lift to you today, O oh God, the brokenness of our world. Protect lives and pave the way toward peaceful negotiations and restoration wherever people live threatened by one another. We pray for those who give their lives to protect and save others. We pray for elected officials that they act as your instruments of justice and seek the common good. We pray for those who are incarcerated and for their loved ones. We pray that you would release those who are caught in human trafficking, turn lives around that all your children may live into their potential as your beloved people. We ask, O oh God, that you would comfort all who mourn the loss of loved ones or the loss of homes or jobs. Bring healing to those who suffer from illness or injury. Repair relationships that are strained. Bring a sense of purpose back to those who feel lost. Restore in all of us, O oh God, the joy of living full and abundant lives. This we ask in the name of Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today, it is my great joy to introduce and welcome our two newest members to our Madison Street family, Morgan Tingle and Zach Sharp. Zach was baptized on Sunday, February 28th, and made a profession of faith, and he and Morgan joined our congregation at that time, and I wanted to introduce them to you today. I also want to remind you that we are collecting candy for our resurrection egg hunt. And so if you are able to bring by candy, you may do so at our Commerce Street doors, which will be open from 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. And now, friends, as always, I invite you to give as you are led and as you are able, trusting that God takes what we give and honors our sacrifice and uses it to bless others. Thanks be to God.
Friends, if you are worshiping with us for the first time online this morning, we extend a special welcome to you. We encourage you again to fill out that digital attendance card so that we can help you connect more deeply and more meaningfully to the ministry opportunities here at Madison Street. If you think you're being called to explore church membership here, we encourage you to consider being part of our next Discover Madison Street class, which will be held on Sunday, March the 21st at 1130 a.m. That will be a hybrid course, which means you can either join it virtually via Zoom or you can join us here in person at the church. If you go to our website and click on events and registrations, you will find the link there to register for that class. Friends, Holy Week and Easter are quickly approaching. In the next few days, you will receive from us, or you may actually have already received from us, information detailing the schedule of worship services that will be happening here during Holy Week and on Easter Sunday morning. This would include Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Sunday morning services. I want to take just a second to talk about the in-person Easter Sunday morning worship opportunities. There are going to be four of them. The first one will begin at 7.30 a.m. It will be an outdoor service, and we will gather at the cross on the front lawn of the church right outside the main doors of our sanctuary. At 8.15 will be the second service. It will be here in the sanctuary. It will be a service of Holy Communion, and the music for that service will include a string quartet and soloists. And the final two services of Easter Sunday will be held at 10 o'clock a.m. and 11.30 a.m. Both of those will be here in the sanctuary. They will feature choir and organ and brass. There are also going to be on Easter Sunday morning a host of other activities for children and families, including the Family Butterfly Workshop and the Resurrection Egg Hunt, so be on the lookout for those. And in order for us to plan most effectively, friends, we are going to ask you to register if you plan to attend one of the in-person services on Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. That will help us to plan most effectively in order to create safe distance, socially distant space, so that we can all be in this space together, worshiping safely. In the next few days, you'll receive information from the church with a link via email where you can register for any of the in-person services on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday, that you want to attend. And of course, we will still continue our virtual services for those who prefer to worship at home. And now, friends, as we prepare to go out into the world, may we do so singing our faith together.
And now, let us go forth trusting in God's presence, God's provision, and God's love. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours on this day and evermore. Amen. Thank you.